Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast, where we interview remarkable people and share strategies for mastering money and living a meaningful life. With your host, Grant Sabatier, creator of Millennial Money and author of Financial Freedom, a proven path to all the money you will ever need. Hey everyone, I'm really excited about this episode, which was recorded over a year ago, and I'd lost it, but I just found it. It's with Vicki Robin when she came to visit me in New York, and we're talking about how to prepare for an uncertain future. Of course, this is before the coronavirus pandemic, but now it's more relevant than ever. I hope you enjoy. This episode is sponsored by Capital, the savings and investing app that I'll tell you more about in the middle of this episode. What's the most valuable asset in the world? It's not Bitcoin or gold or even Malibu real estate. It's art. And when I say valuable, I mean really valuable, like $450 million for a single painting valuable. With market volatility at nearly an all-time high, that's why 86% of wealth managers now recommend investing in art as a way to diversify your portfolio, which matters especially now. Whether you're looking for passive income or long-term growth, I want to introduce you to Masterworks, the first platform for buying and selling shares of great works of art by artists like Banksy, Cause, Basquiat, and many more. Save literally thousands of dollars on upfront costs and fees and potentially earn up to double-digit returns on your art investment. And start your passive income journey now at Masterworks. Listeners of the Financial Freedom Podcast can go to masterworks.io and get zero trading fees for life. That's masterworks.io. This episode is also brought to you by ShipStation.com. One challenge I've always had is how to easily ship my books and products like the Money Talk cards online. Just this past month, I've shipped over 50 signed copies of Financial Freedom and went looking for an easier way to get the best rate. ShipStation helps online sellers of any size save time and money on their shipping costs, and they compare prices across all the major carriers like FedEx, UPS, and even Amazon Fulfillment. And right now, Financial Freedom listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use the offer code FREEDOM. Make sure your business is ready to meet the demands of delivery culture. Get started at ShipStation dot com today click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in freedom that's shipstation.com then enter the offer code freedom shipstation.com make ship happen hey everyone i'm really excited today on the podcast to have my dear dear friend and mentor back on the show vicky robin vicky and i've been hanging out in new york city for the past four days having a lot of fun, scheming, having a lot of chats. (laughs) And I got a question from a reader a couple of months ago that I've really been thinking about and really wanted to chat with Vicky about. And I've been saving this question until I could have her back on the show. So one of my readers reached out and said, that they wanted to invest in a 2050 target date index fund and whether I thought that that was a good idea. And it was really the first time that it hit me, what's the world even going to look like in 2050? You know, we're at 2020 next year. So 30 years from now, will investments even matter given all of the information uh, that's coming to light about the climate and climate change and for the first time ever, this conversation, which I know, Vicki, you've been a part of for many years, seems to be reaching um, at least the mainstream where everyone's talking about climate change. And we, we might already be too far down the path of the destruction of our planet. And in the context of money, uh, how should this impact how we think about our relationship with money and how we're going to best survive in the future? Small question, Grant. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's there's so much to that question. And of course, everybody knows that nobody knows the future, that it's all best guesses based on the data set you're looking at. And some of our data sets are just our own bodies, how we feel about it. And some of our data sets are our social circles. And some of our data sets are our news sources, you know. So who knows what reality is anymore, at least, you know, that as it shows up through the human mind. But there is a shared data set, which is that we all do live on this planet. And so whatever 
happens. You know, the old John Donne, you know, no man is an island. The bell tolls for the, the illusion that we can create separation and create survival for ourselves while other people suffer. That illusion is getting challenged by the fact that there's so much shared challenge that's coming through the climate. Yeah, one way to talk about it is basically human ingenuity. And I'm not talking about human ingenuity. Like people say, like, oh, I don't have to think about this because humans are clever. You know, we'll figure out a way. Well, I, I think that is a, a major irresponsible punk. But there is the fact that one of the unique things that, that has allowed humans to become the top dog species on the planet is our our niche adaptability. We have an ability to process information so that we can actually move between cultures, you know, so people can move in and out of, you're not stuck in like, I'm, a, I'm in this little sub niche in the forest. I can move anywhere. So there are, I, you know, you don't like it when I do this, but I call people smart rats, you know, I mean, that the aspect of us that's smart rats, that is basically deep survival instinct coupled with an amazing intellect that has imagination. So that alone, you you see, okay, well, humans are going to not figure this out for everyone. I don't have to worry about my little house and savings account. No, but, but humans who are adaptable who or who have a predatory nature, you know, whether you're adaptable because you're spacious is, is psychologically and spiritually or whether you're adaptable because you're sociopathic. There's going to be that happening. So humans are going to do that. It's not clear what kind of societies, individual humans, in doing their own maximizing my survival adaptations in landscapes that they're unfamiliar with. It's not clear how that's going to happen. You know, and there are people who are Always, there are people who are predicting the worst and predicting the best. You know, the new age idea is that we're all in this evolutionary journey and the pressure of, of this evolutionary wall is going to push out the worst of us and the best of us is going to come through. Or, you know, there are people who imagine, you know, roving hordes of people maiming and stealing across the countryside. So who knows what happens? But... I think one valuable thing anybody can do if we're doing like, oh, what should I do about this? <laughs> one valuable thing <laughs> is to really, really, really understand your own psychology and your value set and understand and try to craft for yourself. How am I going to, how am I going to retain what I, I consider me? Do I consider me the sociopathic? I'm going to take your food. Or do I consider me the generous person who creates cooperative situations wherever I go? You know, so you cultivate the capacity, the inner resilience to be able to reach into your higher values, even as, you know, your physicality and your, the predictability of your surround is happening. So at that level, that's part of why I, I see my sense of the future and many people I know who do remote viewing and try to, you know, use whatever psychic abilities we have to see the future. So many people will see small scale human settlements in large swaths of forest. And in a way for me, that's like, oh God, at least there's forest. So that's on the human humans and adaptability. Then on the other side of the equation are sort of the hard facts of the climate. And we have gotten habituated you know, one of the masterful things that humans have done is, to our benefit and our curse, is alter the environment in service to us. That's actually how humans have ended up seeing the planet as ours. And it, everything on it from animal, vegetable, mineral is a resource for humans. And you have to, like, step back and realize that is insane. That's like my whole body is in service to me being able to consume things visually. And I don't care about my armpit as long as I can see. I will harvest everything from my body in service to seeing. You know, that's how the humans are in relationship with the body of the planet, which we come out of and return to. And whether there's a heaven in our consciousness, you know, our elevated consciousness goes on, who knows? It's insane. We have to face it. We have an insane relationship with the world we live in. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about 
obviously the question was about investing in something like the stock yeah, market. Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, but I, I think I think the no, no, I, I love that context. I think the pivot point is how do you think about investing in the context of designing your life? Oh, okay. To best set yourself up, you know, there's some key themes that I think have gone through our conversations the last couple of days, uh, adaptation being mm-hmm. one of them, resourcefulness mm-hmm. being another one, community being sort of a third theme. And at a time when all the data shows by 2050, 80% of the human race are going to live in cities, right? Uh, what you talk about is, is almost reverting from that a little bit here in a more tribal sense of forming maybe smaller, more tight-knit communities where currency is expressed in many different forms, you know? Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about, you know, at a, at a somewhat practical level, someone listening to this, no matter how old they are, increasingly worried about the future, and we often view money as a security blanket, but money is just one piece of the puzzle. And obviously, we've talked about the spiritual dimensions and how to prepare yourself there, but... How, how can someone best invest in designing their own life to set themselves up for an increasingly uncertain future? Wow. Yeah. So that's a great question. And um, because nobody knows the future, I'm just going to be doing my own form of BS. But here's my BS. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think that, okay, just let's go to climate change. The UN is now, you know, a a series of reports in between the major reports, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, series of reports recently about agriculture, about societies, and really saying we've got about 10 years. We've got a 10-year window. That doesn't mean like in nine and a half years, boom, get our act together and we've got it nailed. It's like the grind is on. And there are people who think that, we're in a near-term human extinction five years. That's, you know, there's some people who are over there and some people who are over in La La Land. It's all going to, we're going to pull our chests out of the fire. So what I've done, I just want to say climate impacts. We think about sea level rise and we don't think as much about agriculture because agriculture disappears for us because it's just the grocery store. But you have agriculture collapse because of water, or fertility, salinization of soil, soil depletion. There's so many things that are going on that industrial agriculture has actually consumed the fertility of soil. So you have agriculture collapse, and you're going to see massive starvation. So sea level rise, boom, your house is gone. But, you know, you can't survive for more than a week or so without access to food. So there's plastics and toxins, you know, we, you know, we've stacked the deck, not only CO2 in the atmosphere, but we stacked the deck. The, the predictable world that we've lived in, the world that we inherited, the world that we refer to like, oh, it's always been this way for the last 75 years. You look at the charts, it's always been this way. It's always going to be this way. I mean, maybe it will be, but my money, if you will, is um, I'm putting basically the topsoil of my own security someplace else. So number one, yes, money, because who knows how long it lasts. The other thing that may or may not last is the Internet or access, general access to the Internet. And that's going to be an amazing shift for people if you think that banking is all something online. So stashing cash, almost all people I know who are thinking about this will have stashed thousands of dollars in actual cash. Some people I know have a bucket of silver coins in their attic. You know, mm-hmm. and I was talking to you the other day about, you know, back when, you know, 10 years ago, we were working on this idea of transition towns of like actually facing into peak oil and transitioning our towns. And I thought, okay, my trading shit is going to be pints of whiskey because I'll tell you, you know, if things get bad, people are going to use pints of whiskey, which I haven't enacted, but I'm going to go get myself a case of whiskey. Um, and then there's location, location, location. Just taking an honest look at the climate maps and the smart people are already doing this. and. My state, Washington State, people are starting to realize we're going to have internal migration up to Washington State, and it's probably going to get very intense. You know, people are going to try to get out of the United States, by the way. <laughs> Canada is going to build a wall. 
But before they do, I'm going to get over there. So you look at the maps and you th- you see, by and large, as the planet warms, ecosystems is going to like habitable, viable ecosystems moving north. You know, so don't believe me. Just look at the maps and ask yourself: Am I someplace? Do I want to be here in ten years? Where do I want to be in ten years? And how can I relocate there? Then, then, okay, so you've relocated. Then you've relocated to a place where people are already living and they don't recognize you as anything other than a tourist with money, you know? So how do you actually learn to belong someplace? How do you learn to become indigenous in even the most minor way to an ecosystem that you've moved into? It's a social ecosystem. You know, there's, there's, you know, the clubs and the history and the people who love each other and hate each other and the churches across the way, you know, like that is a whole world. And that world has a currency. People help each other because they recognize each other as part of themselves, Mm -hmm. not because they're nice rural people and they're going to take care of a city person who comes and plops down, you know, with their broken knee or something. So you you enter into a non-monetary but very real currency of belonging. And that takes some time, you know, to build up that asset of belonging. And to make yourself a useful actor, you know, you join a church, you volunteer in the community garden, whatever. So location, location, location. I'm very concrete. I'm I'm not very abstract. So I have not taken advantage of all the wealth creation available in this stock market. But I have used real estate as a way both to have a place to live, to earn some money, and to have a trading chip in the future. I have a house with two, you know, it's fundamentally a triplex and then a rental house. And so people can't see. I'm like, like waving my hands around like, like little pots of gold here. You know, those, those are some of my pots of gold. I belong to a network of people who are interested in investing in local businesses. And that's another way I have turned my monetary wealth into resource for my community and in a way when number one it it builds relationships it builds the businesses builds uh, prosperity for my community so that we can hire people and people can actually make money there and it builds i invested a lot in farming i recognize that my food system is my survival and this is not all I'm, i'm talking from a personal survivalist i'm talking from my smart rat Sure. Because that's what you asked me. You asked me about smart rat stuff. Yeah. So location, belonging, community. And so we're used to the consumer culture, the way humans' minds have been constructed, especially the privileged Western mind, is that it's all a cornucopia and you can leave it alone and it'll just take care of itself. But when you need something, boom, I'm going to go reach in and get something out of it. My like a joke, my tombstone, if there's such a thing as tombstones at the time I die, will be, it's a relational world. That's the shift. And the other world, I call it a billiard ball world. I move, I hit something, I move, get that thing out of the way. Sure. And I win by bumping into things and getting them to move. And the, the relational world is I build up capacity all around me because my safety is in the prosperity and safety of the collective. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's dive into community generally because, uh, you know, at least for my generation, a lot of our sense of community is built online. As we live in cities, it's harder to get to know your neighbors. You know, for example, I live in New York City, uh, just moved here a year ago. And while I know the nice couple that live downstairs and the ones in the basement apartment, everyone is friendly enough, but it's not a situation where if we got into a pickle, I could rely on them in any sense because I'm not really building a relationship with them. And as you mentioned, it takes time. And one of the resources that we're starved for. I think you wrote about this a little while ago. We talked about it is sort of personal time is the final frontier. And so if you don't take the time to be intentional in building relationships, in building a community and investing the time, because as you're saying, I think you said it took you three years or so before you felt rooted in your own community, that, that's an investment. And that requires patience and flexibility and being uncomfortable. I think you mentioned a book 
maybe how to move to a small town. Right, right, by Wanda Urbanska. Yeah, and and I'd love if you'd explore that idea of someone who maybe doesn't have community in their life. How do you build that? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is you, as you talk about this, uh, the habit of our minds is that we're individuals and everybody else out there is individuals. We don't see their nets of belonging. We just see a human body walking along the street. We don't see their children, their parents, their grandparents. We don't see their church. We don't see their, the people they went to high school with. We don't see the webs that they're part of. And we're not building out of nothing. So you, let's say, move to a small town. There are webs of relationship. You don't have to build a community. You find ways to join communities. And one way is through churches. I mean, if you have um, belief structures that, you know, are favorable to joining a church, that's beneficial because churches have deep roots in small towns. That is the, that is the town place, you know. So you, you join churches or you join groups or book groups or you go to the coffee shop in town and you kind of like go and work in several coffee shops in town and you just watch. You know, it, 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 almost everywhere, whether it's a diner or coffee shop, there's the group of retired men who get together for coffee in the morning. So you start to observe, it's like there's a, an approach to the flow of resources through landscapes called permaculture. This comes from the idea of permanent mm-hmm. agriculture. And so any system has energy flowing through it. And then there are barriers to flow. And then there's like, you know, so basically when you work with a system, you're just sort of observing what the relationships are. And in permaculture, if you buy a property, they say just for the first year, you just observe how the sun moves across the property where the water goes, where dry spots and wet spots. You just observe how energy flows through the system. So the same thing with a small town or a community. How's energy flowing here? You know, if there's a, there's always going to be, like we have something called Drew's List that's like Craigslist, or there's, there's Facebook groups, you know, the South would be buy, sell, and trade. So you start to read these things like they're the small town newspaper. Mm-hmm. You start to see how life is operating there. And you join in constructively. Like when I moved, um, I'm a thrift store shopper anyway, but I started volunteering to price shoes at the thrift store. I love doing that. You know, and I just felt, I just, you start to feel the place. So you don't, you're not consuming it. You're feeling it. You know, for me, it feels like a surround. It feels like something that actually is contiguous with my own skin. And some people go like, ish, ish, ish. Doesn't that feel confining? And the cool thing is, is I can always go home. And now a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Capital, a banking app that helps you create and automate successful money habits. Designed in collaboration with Professor Dan Ariely, the world's leading behavioral economist, Capital can help you reach your financial goals with smarter checking, savings, and investing tools. With over 70,000 five-star ratings in the App Store and on Google Play, over 2 million users, and over $1 billion saved, Capital is worth checking out if you want to take your money to the next level. I've used it and find it intuitive and a no-brainer if you want to maximize the amount of money you're saving automatically and easily. To sign up, go to millennialmoney.com capital. That's Q-A-P-I-T-A-L or go to capital.com or download straight from the App Store or Google Play. And don't forget to use the code GRANT to get $25 towards your first savings goal. I mean, this is such a foreign concept, you know, I think to me and a lot of my generation, because I think I was reading something, the average millennial lives in a certain place, like 2.4 years, and then moves on to another city or another town or another place. And increasingly, the flow still is to cities where rents are more expensive and housing is more expensive. And so the limited resources for jobs that where wages aren't growing, more and more of it's going to housing, more and more of it, you know, you've got to work more of the day in order to afford, you know, your biggest expenses. That's a recipe for disaster Mm -hmm. in a world with increasing demands on resources and energy flows. And the idea I'm thinking about uh, is where can I buy a farm, whether it's in the Hudson River Valley or Maine or Vermont, 
where it's still relatively affordable because there hasn't been this migration yet. And how can I integrate into a community and build a community as well as start farming? And, you know, at the end of the day, if you can eliminate your housing expense by buying an affordable piece of property, grow your own food, so eliminate your food expense, and then, you know, drive some form of an electric car, bicycle, mix, you can design your life, I'm, I'm feeling, in a way that requires less and less of the infrastructure, let's say, resources uh, of the planet and has the added benefit of being a hedge, being a, a way to be self-sustaining and supporting as well as, obviously, we talked a little about if you grow more food, then you can support more people. And I'm, I'm thinking about this now even more so than I'm thinking about what stock should I buy and what should I invest in. So my entire idea of investing has transitioned given what I'm learning about where the world is going to be over the next you know, 30 right. to 50 years. And so let's go to the downside of everything I just said. Number one, people are moving to the cities because that's where opportunity is. You know, whether it's climate change or Nestle buying up the water resources of towns and drying them up, rural life has become extremely difficult. You know, the reason there's so many, much migration out of Central America is because of political disruption, but also because the climate is changing and people cannot grow food. Growing food is like no joke. You start reading some of the young farmer literature, you know, people who went back to the land and, you know, the happy little couple on the cover of the book. It's really tough. And you've put everything in to your whatever it is. I mean, think about the Irish potato blight. There's a movie for you to see called The Biggest Little Farm. It's great. I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. And you see how the coyotes mm -hmm. got the chickens. Yep. How you buy chickens and you're feeding. And the backstory of that, you watch that movie and you go like, those guys had multi-million dollar backers mm -hmm. and they're still busting butt. But, you know, all the people who built out the plan, who are those people and who paid them? They did the compost manure setup. That is like a million dollar setup, you know, a hundred thousand dollar setup, yeah. whatever. Eking out a living without, you know, and I know you, so you will use your intelligence and your privilege and your foresight. You will use that and your resources and you will buy, build that like a worm casting. <laughs> yeah. But it's, there is an incredible vulnerability when you invest in a small town and you've rooted there, you haven't invested in the town over. It's hedging against the monetary economy crashing. So I'm hedging with the real economy of human beings. But then if that economy crashes, you've learned the skills of belonging, but the set of people in the place and the crop and the animals, all that, that's very challenging. So we're not, I'm not talking about La La Land, you know, it's going to be like a happy little, f but I think we talk in like the fire thing about multiple streams of income or diversifying your investments. You don't have to diversify by buying a farm. You can diversify by having a summer cottage up at the lake. Mm -hmm. It's not just you're using the lake, you know, right, and the cottage. Right. You're, okay, this is a community. Even if I'm just practicing, what's it like to enter into a community as a constructive player, not just as a consumer? Yeah. So you start to feel it, to have maybe one foot in the money world and finance world and another foot in the real world and, and sort of the foundations and building networks of friends. And part of how you do that is you help other people. Mm -hmm. you know? When they're going through something, bring the apple pie over. Oh, I didn't know how to make an apple pie over. Right. Oh, like, oh, how do you make an apple pie? Like, <laughs> it, Yeah, it just seems like we're going to hit our limit. And the crazy thing... You know, you see all these forces combining of, of people moving to the cities and not saving money and not, I mean, just at, at its bare bones, as you talked about, having $10,000 worth of cash. So if it's needed down the road and it's almost like there needs to be a return back to a more human lifestyle mm. in a way where not only are you less reliant on the infrastructure but 
yeah, your relationships and everything we've talked about today. And I, I think that that's very, very challenging and completely in conflict with how at least my generation's been raised. Totally. And your parents didn't know any different. Right. I right. mean, you were raised by boomer parents. Mm -hmm. Boomers were the anointed ones. You know, we were the, the progeny of the greatest generation of like, we've made it through the First World War. We made it through the Depression. We vanquished the Nazis and the fascists. And here we are. And it's the promised land. And it is a very expansive sense of a personal sense of generosity even if you're a bit of an oaf you know <laughs> like the, yeah you know with your madras plaid shorts in europe <laughs> <laughs> so you're a product of your parents generation which was formed at a different time i want to from what you're saying i want to jump over to a framework that is um inspiring me and a lot of other people that was presented by a sustainability academic and a leadership trainer uh, named Jem, J-E-M Bendel. And he has a paper called Deep Adaptation. And he started, it comes out of him recognizing that everything he was doing and teaching in the field of sustainability was coming out of some presumptions that were not going to last as the intensity of the climate consequences come upon us. And so he says, it's not just an adaptation like building a seawall. It's an adapt. It's a deeper adaptation that has to do with your psychology, your expectations. And he has a framework that he calls resilience, relinquishment, and restoration. I would add some words in there, but anyway. So the resilience part is the capacity to basically receive the blows of life and allow them to make you stronger. You know, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. That sort of get, becoming stronger psychologically, spiritually, relationally. So there's a resilience piece of like, what can I cultivate inside me that has the strength to endure times of great change? And then the relinquishment is... What is built into my sense of enoughness, if you will, you know, or identity, that I just, it just has to go, you know, particular expectations about achievement, particular expectations about your career path or about, you know, what needs to be relinquished in the face of the enormity of what's coming? What do I need to let go of that's actually, you know, we th I thought it was me, but it's actually ballast. There's another me in here that is going to be better off without that stuff. And a lot of people on the financial independence path have already done the relinquishment materially, you know, and have started to discover that if I let go of buying my way through life, there's an awful lot of opportunities for relationship and learning that I don't get to enjoy because I just think I'm going to buy a product or a service and that will handle it for me. So there's, there's the resilience. How can I become stronger? And part of resilience is, is having not just one little point on which you, you balance, but resilience is having multiple streams of income, multiple, this multiple, that resilience is groundedness. And then there's the relinquishment like ballast, what ballast are they going? And res restoration is, Humans have been on this planet for what? How many? A long time. Billion years, you know? <laughs> we have, what, 10 million years of human history that we know of? Yeah, so, how, I mean, obviously humans have done very, very well without the internet. Right. Very, very well. You know, very, very well. You go to Venice to see all the, the amazing paintings. That was before the internet and electricity. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of, or the, you know, I'm thinking a lot about the indigenous people on the North American continent and what a genocide, but look at the concentration. There were, there was something that, the the people who were inundated through slavery and colonialism, there is a concentration of something, you know, what are the values and behaviors that no matter what the context that embodies my tribe, my family. You know, this family is always about generosity. You know, boom. You know, and you can diminish my family and you can put us into poverty, but we will never not be generous because that's who we are. So there is a who we are prior to all of the fufara that we've added on that's, that's made it it's fun, it's comfortable, but it's, you know, it's privilege. Behind all the privilege, there still is, hopefully, 
you know, you can draw on, if not in your own family history, you can draw on in your community history, you can draw on history of the continent. Humans do this. We get through it. So there's things that are going to get restored, and maybe they will be better. Maybe we will be singing around the campfire. And, you know, it's not like a guarantee, oh, I'll let go of my Maserati because it's going to be so much fun to sing Kumbaya. Maybe, maybe not. But these are this resilience, relinquishment, and restoration. To that, I add my little R word is resourcefulness. You know, all the rewords, repurpose, re- reuse, recycle, rethink, all the rewords are really good words rebuild, to think about, yeah. rebuild. But resourcefulness is like saying it is the combination of my love and will through my healthy body that I will, of any circumstance, I will make something good for myself and for those around me. That's what I consider my major resource. Yeah, I love this idea that it's almost like there'll probably at some point in the future be the who you are before climate change and then the who you are after. And we've been talking a little bit even this morning about cycles of life and getting closure and evolving and growing. Not all of this needs to be negative. And I like the the tinge of hope there in your answer because you're right, we don't know. And this is an increasingly scary time. And it's important to prepare for it, not just at a monetary level, but at a resource level and at a spiritual level. But there is something to be said for all of this being a mirror to our humanity and our mortality. And You know, there's a lot of people out there who are pretty unhappy and the system is designed, you know, as we know, a lot of capitalism is built on exploitation and wage slavery and people having to get up and go through the daily grind. But perhaps there is some cataclysmic event or shift that starts to bind people together um, consciously and unconsciously and creates more maybe truth and meaning and aliveness in life. I'm just thinking here, you know, I think we might have been talking about it or I was talking with someone about it a little while ago that there's all this fighting, you know, across all these nations and, you know, everyone's going after their own territories and governments and politics and all this stuff. And what would happen literally if aliens showed up tomorrow? I think more than climate change, we would say, "Uh uh-oh, and we as a human race would band together and come together, you know, either against or at least to understand this sort of other force. And it's it almost feels like that's happening a little bit in our culture where more and more people are starting to wake up to this idea of, oh, whoa, our planet, we've got to live here. And that moment when you know, even sort of selfish or asleep people start to pay attention and they're like, oh, what about my family? What about my home? It it seems like there could really be a, a positive turn here in the sense of bringing us all together in a way that I really feel like we haven't been together. It's Uh, possible. Yeah. But I think people who are just waking up now are real, real latecomers to the party. Sure. And because we have so much denial in the system. We have so many consequences. You know, we've just loaded up the consequences. We've loaded up things that we've started that cannot be finished. We we've been in overshoot for overshoot is using more of the planet's resources on an annual basis than can be regenerated since someplace in the mid to late eighties. You know, so Earth Overshoot Day, the day we've we've like used up our budget of regenerative capacity of the planet overshoot day is now july 29th in other words we're almost like a whole half a year is taking from the future i mean the level of debt the level of ecological and financial debt we've loaded up so these are consequences for future generations is serious business i would like to think oh we could come out of this better and people could wait yeah i some people will Mm-hmm. Some people will go into compounds. <laughs> you know, they're already buying up really great agricultural land. Some people will upload themselves into some sort of 
eternal computer thing. Some people will do the singularity and, and, you know, eventually computers will, will be better able to be, you know, whatever proto humans than humans are. And so it, we upload into a silicon life. We have multiple, multiple futures that are, are in play right now. It makes it very interesting. I used to be somebody who was blah, 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 blah. Here's all the problem, 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 problem. Oh, but here's the hope, you know, because we're very addicted to hope because we won't act unless we have. But I think the hope is in facing. <laughs> I think the hope, if there is any, for any individual or maybe even community is facing reality. And in facing reality, a maturation and I have no idea how that's going to turn out, but I am very clear that there are multiple pathways forward right now that the, um, and that we're, since we are so ecologically and, and financially indebted that we may be able to keep this story going. We may be able to like keep blowing up this like balloon of, of, of capitalism and consumerism. We may be able to, I thought it was going to burst decades ago. So don't listen to me, you know? <laughs> It may keep going more and more. And so that everybody has the illusion they're part of something that is still prosperous. But when it breaks, we're going to find out who was inside the balloon and who was outside. <laughs> you know, and because there are people who are hedging against the collapse big time right now. So I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I do know that facing this reality, allowing yourself to feel it, incorporate the range of things that we might be confronting, do the best you can to stabilize your own, you know, self and your family, do the best you can. And part of the best you can is knowing that the best you can may not work, but you know what? You're still alive and you're still alive with other people for whom it's not working. And then you have all your social skills, you know, it's like, that's what it's interesting. That's the fairy tale is over. We just don't see it yet. Am I telling people that their index fund strategy isn't going to work? I can't tell you that. I have no idea. What's very clear to me now is I blindly believe that, okay, save a million dollars, invest in index funds, get everything set up. You know, you're going to be set for life. And it's very clear that there is a much more complex definition of security, resources, interdependence, and an increasingly shifting world where having enough money will likely be important, but probably not sufficient. And so if you have $3 million in 2050 or $5 million, but there's no food available and you don't know how to grow food or you don't have anywhere to grow food, it's it's a completely you know moot, totally. moot point. Joe used to Joe Dominguez who was originated the nine step program in Your Money Your Life. When we just was sharing it with friends and people would do this and then they would go like I'm financially independent. His financial independence gift was a Russian bond, a coupon bond because that's how bonds were back in the day. You bought a bond and it had coupons on it, and every time. You know, you clipped a coupon every mm -hmm. six months and you took it to the bank and you turned it into money. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was a debt instrument, but it wasn't electronic. It was all these coupons. And the coupons are all clipped until 1917 in the Russian Revolution. So the bond was worth so much until the revolution. And then it was not worth the paper it was printed on. And he yeah. got like a big box of Russian bonds that he thought he was, he would, you know, just somebody had them and they sold them off and he thought maybe I'll paper my bathroom with them. <laughs> but, you know, that was his saying like, this, this is not, there's nothing secure. Money is just an agreement about value. You know, it's like when he, when he taught the live seminar, he said, yeah, good luck. You're stranded on a, you know, an island in the middle of the Amazon and you haven't had anything to eat, you know, and you like, but you have your wallet, you know, and there's like some people come by and pung us, you know, and you like, take out your wallet, please, you know, help me. And, you know, and they're headhunters. Yeah. You know, your money <laughs> is worth nothing, nothing if you are not in a circumstance where there's an agreement that it's, it's faith, it's trust, it's a trust system. 
And we, we go unconscious, do not understand that this is all a story you're living inside. And so, you know, it's not like go be a survivalist, but yeah, you know, like you want to, in terms of your materiality, what do I need in order to survive? And our individualistic mindset is always thinking, I'm going to grow food. How do I become part of a community where I am valuable enough to other people that they want me to survive? <laughs> so this this all comes full circle with and I have one more question. You know, in your money or your life, it's very clear that building your life and living your life is what matters. It's the most important work. And I think when confronted with all of this change, we come back to this idea that should we be making all of the sacrifices that we're making in our lives today to make more money and save more money at the expense of building a community, which is what we're doing, or building other skills. What does it mean to put designing your life before accumulating money? Well, as we say, nobody knows the future, so you have multiple streams of activity it's not like, oh, I'm going to live a balanced life and I'm a life coach and I understand balance because there's the, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, but it is saying that you don't want to sacrifice any crucial part of your life to another part of your life. And so we're very out unbalanced in terms of resting on money. So it's starting to take a look at what are the other areas of my life? Friendships. Homemaking, you know, homemaking is like whether you own a house or rent or like your basic household, being a householder, being a family member, being a friend, you know, all of these areas, keeping them all functioning. And sometimes you'll say, okay, this period of time, these three years, I'm going to like dive into the money making part or these five years, I'm going to have my two children and just love them up one side and down the other and you know, change a thousand diapers. It's not everything has to be balanced each day, like sort of like the food pyramid, and, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. But in some way, it's consciousness. It's, it's how you pay attention. Because we don't know. You know, I mean, I don't want to be the person who says the world is ending, on, uh, you know, midnight on XYZ day and the world doesn't end. Nobody knows the future. So, and yet we also know that Noah built an ark. And all the animals that got on the ark survived. So between those two things, like you don't want to be an idiot and predict the end of the world and it doesn't come, and you don't want to be an idiot and not get on the ark, someplace right. in there you make a life. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks thanks for hanging out. Thanks for all the wisdom. And um, I don't know. I'm not being very helpful. No, it's super helpful. These these are important things. This is, uh, you know, I think that idea of are you being conscious of it? Are you being aware? Are you feeling the shifts in your own life? You know, the huge shift for me was when I started letting my emotions and whether it's emotions or heart or intuition guide my life as opposed to just my mind. And that's when a lot of new things started showing up because we're not going to think ourselves out of this entirely. You know, there's a, there's a, a Yiddish word, a mensch, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's like what we're talking about is be a mensch, yeah. you know, be a mensch is like a, just like a basic good person, right? you know, just to be a basic good person, take care of other people, care about other people. Join the city cleanup, join the, the temple, join the church, you know, like, care. Care. Be a mensch. Yeah, be yeah. a mensch. <laughs> That's the advice. So thank, thank you, Vicky, <laughs> for coming back on the show. Uh, we'll chat soon and hope all of you out there, uh, no matter where you're at, are having a good day. And we'll be back soon. <laughs>